When I think about my Pacific Northwest childhood and where I'm from, where I belong, where my sense of self and identity is rooted, I realize it's very much grounded in the natural world. The sense of humidity in the air, the olfactory melange of evergreen, skunk cabbage, and kelp, the sight of moss on every tree, or the feel of dirt and trails so rich in organic matter that they seem to bounce when you walk on them. Now, even though I've lived elsewhere for longer, my childhood experiences in the outside world were formative to how I think about myself. Welcome to Riding Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Metzl. Today, we speak with historian Molly P. Rosa and her work tracing similar ideas among the children of first-generation settlers on the American Northern Plains and Canadian prairies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In her new book, Grasslands Grown, Creating Place on the U.S. Northern Plains and Canadian Prairies, published in 2021 by the University of Nebraska Press and University of Manitoba Press. Thanks for listening. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about writing Westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West, historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects, and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. Molly P. Rosam is Associate Professor of History and the Ronald M. Nelson Distinguished Professor and Chair of Great Plains and South Dakota History at the University of South Dakota. She holds degrees in American Studies, Folklore, and History. She is the editor, co-editor, and author of multiple books and articles on Plains history. Her most recent book that we talk about today, Grasslands Grown, Creating Place on the U.S. Northern Plains and Canadian Prairies, was published in 2021 by the University of Nebraska Press and University of Manitoba Press. In this beautifully written book, Rosamund covers the lives of children who were the first generation of their settler families to grow up on the plains and prairies. Through deeply intimate and individual narrative stories, she reveals how children's experiences with the land, its climate, plants, animals, and seasons, shaped their sense of self and belonging, and in time, influenced how they formed identities for their home region. Her work is meticulously researched. And although it does a lot of big picture regional thinking, it is consistently grounded in individual human stories. There's a great sense of humanity in her writing. And this is aided by evocative prose with a lyrical quality. Those with families from these grasslands will find tremendous value in Rosam's work, helping them think critically and creatively about their own intergenerational family traditions of place and identity. And for the rest of us, this book can help all of us carefully examine the place-based stories and traditions of our own families. We all come from somewhere, and the different ways in which we construct belonging and a sense of regional self and identity is a puzzle worth solving for all of us. Professor Molly Rosen, welcome to Reading Westward. Uh, Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to bring the podcast back out to the plains. Uh, A lot of what we've covered has been more mountain west. And since I spent about a decade of my life on the plains, I feel some guilt about that. Okay. Yes, I'm happy. (laughs) I'm happy to share um, what I've done in Grasslands Grown. Yeah, I'm also excited that we're going to get north of the border and kind of push our thinking about the west across these borders that we've imposed over the region. And we often forget the Canadian prairies are a thing. 
So, uh, yeah, so we're going to cover a lot of, uh, I think, productive ground today uh, for kind of uh, the, the regional parameters of what I want this podcast to be. So grasslands grown, um, sorry, grasslands grown um, uh, in a study of first generation non-Indigenous settler kids who grew up on the northern plains of the U.S., prairies of Canada, and then their the formation of their regional identities and sense of belonging. So this isn't your first book on the Northern Plains, um, and you've even done some stuff with, with childhood and stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about the previous work you've done and how it led you to researching and writing Grasslands Grown? Sure, I can do that. And in some ways, Grasslands Grown, though, is a book I've been working on for a long time. And these other uh, books that you're talking about, um, one is an edited uh, collection, uh, Small Town Boy, Small Town Girl, I think. And um, I did the introduction to those two autobiographies of, of people who grew up um, in South Dakota. And then I did a uh, edited collection, um, Equality at the Ballot Box, with um, my co-editor, Lori Lalum from Minnesota State University, Mankato, on women's suffrage. And uh, looking at um, the various suffrage movements in honor of the 100th anniversary of the, the 19th Amendment. But in the background has always been grasslands grown. I have been working away probably since my graduate school days on this uh, big project, which took me across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, a little bit of Minnesota visiting archives in all of those places. Uh, so my thinking has been interwoven in those various books. Uh, and, you know, I suppose like many of us, uh, one of the things that inspired me with Grasslands Grown or, or my framing questions about regional identity dates all the way back to New Western history. And where is the West? How do we mark that? And of course, me as a young graduate student back then was, you know, had the idea, well, people aren't asking uh, what Northern Plains settlers thought about this. Where is the West? People aren't, you know, this is a settler society question, really. Where is the American West? This is, you know, where will we draw boundaries? And that's inherent. One of my arguments in Grasslands Grown is, you know, regionalism, the growth of regional identities is part of settler colonialism down the generation. It's another way of claiming land to come up with regional identities. And so thinking about those new Western history questions, you know, trying to revitalize, you know, the way we look at the North American West, I said there, you know, there's a lot of debate here, but we want to go on the ground and ask people who lived during this time period when when, when you know, settler society was sorting out where they were and what they could do in this place. Um, so, so some of the impulses of this book date back to that time. Of course, indigenous peoples had different conceptions of region, and they knew what the grasslands were about. And that's that's sort of a subtext in the book. It's very much as as you noted, focused on you know the first generation of of children of settler society either came there as children or were born there, Th their ideas, although I try to, to kind of put them in, in contrast to what um, indigenous people, you know, reminding us that this is not an indigenous way of knowing. At the same time, I argue these, this generation, the, the most thoughtful of them, and they are not all thoughtful, um, but the most thoughtful of them are influenced by indigenous peoples and what they know about the landscape because they figure out that they don't know what this landscape is about. And yeah. they, they do have an impulse. They, they, they want to figure out how to live in this place. And so they are, it, it kind of opens their mind a bit. And like I said, I, I would have caveats on, on, on their thoughtfulness, but, but there is influence there. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some ways, this book, I, it was percolating a long time and it was percolating a long time in part to get around to the various archives. I tried to, you know, 
I tried to study a big place, a huge geographic region, right, to get these boundaries. But then the structure of the book zooms in to individuals who live scattered across the place. So it allows me to get on the ground level and in a local place to, to ask questions of them about the big region. And I try to I try to analyze how do they think of this region, you know, both locally and then what kind of language do they use actually to describe this place? Yeah, and you do a good job of that balance. And it's hard with regional histories to sometimes they can just get too macro and they always stay at that, you know, 30,000 foot view. But you really ground this in individuals, real kind of intimate stories. And I was curious kind of about your source material. Um, I'm working on a project now where I'm desperately looking for people who are self-reflecting and kind of writing down like, how they're thinking about place and often people's journals and diaries and letters and those things they're not explicitly like rhapsodizing about these more philosophical ideas so so tell us a little bit about your source material and how you tried to pull those ideas out of what you were finding yeah i um thanks for asking that question uh, because I use a variety of source material i mean i went in trying to find the appropriate age group. And it's interesting going around to these archives because a lot of times they might be organized by, you know, the pioneer patriarch, right? Because that's when the collecting took off. Uh, and there are some things to say about these regional institutions also being a signal of the, the regional and the region coming to fruition. People founded regional archives and started to collect this group. But anyway, I went in and, you know, and you had to look through the finding aid to find out, okay, did this pioneer patriarch have children, right? And then did they leave diaries or letters? Is there correspondence? Because a lot of times the children might go off to uh, school somewhere. So they're writing back and forth to um, their parents, right? Or sometimes they did keep diaries. Or um, in some cases, I use novels that, that people wrote. Now, um, uh, I'm interested in those novels, not because they were great literature or poetry, not because it was great poetry. It might be great poetry, and I could make the case for some of them. Uh, but uh, I'm interested for what they were trying to say about place. And, you know, even in a novel that might be considered popular and, it, you know, purchased in its day locally and, and that had some play among a local population, there could be some really nice literary paragraphs or sentences as they tried to work it out. So I use novels, I use memoirs, um, I tried to use letters, diaries, I, um, anything, even, and then in some cases, uh, I found some, some uh, um, individuals who were professionals, and I actually looked at their professional writings to see, okay, he's a, he's a agronomist, but what what in his material might he say in his preface or his conclusion or those moments? So I read a lot of technical things, mm -hmm. sometimes with agriculture that I'm not even sure I understood, right? Um, but they, you know, how we include various parts of our works. And so I, I scanned those things. Uh, another person that I studied, um, his family, George Will, he, he's prominent in the book. Um, he grew up in Bismarck and his father ran a seed company. And then he took over the company around World War One, and he wrote. He started a tradition when they published their annual seed catalog of writing a company letter every year for that catalog. So I I charted his changing ideas over the years from World War One through the twenties, thirties, forties, up to the fifties. Right. Maybe this is an advantage of of letting a book project percolate for so long. Is that well? I mean, one problem is that. You just never stop researching because you always keep finding more stuff, right? Um, but on the flip side, it was just positive because some of these are not places that maybe you would have looked if this was just like a two or three year research project, you know? Exactly. And you kind of you, you kind of encapsulate that, you know, I, I did work on this for a long time and, you know, and there were moments and it's like, well, I could go here. I could go there towards the yeah. end. It's like, okay, let's just, let's, let's. <laughs> Got to finish the book. <laughs> myself, right? You can get, you you understand, you can get really yeah. caught up in your research and you find another candidate somewhere. But, um, but yeah, so, and, and you know, um, 
some of the most, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, endearing or beautiful in their way, letters that I found were sent from my own home state of South Dakota, uh, set of children's letters, a couple sets. Um, uh, and it was the case where these kids were going back and forth. There was a lot of travel in the family, but, you know, I could, I, I had a set of letters from, you know, clearly from the early years of a young boy, his name was Hale Humphrey. And he, he um, was starting to learn how to write. And a lot of his letters um, had drawings of animals, you know, farm animals and, and small, you know, small prairie animals. And he wrote about them. And that, that forms a core of one of my chapters um, uh, on animals and how animal animals shape our sense of place. These people were in touch. Yes, it was part of the railroad era and even part of the automobile comes into their sense of place. But a lot of their day to day travel was shaped by their viewing and experiencing the prairie through animals. But this set of letters and, and then Hale Humphrey had siblings. And so they'd all tuck their letters into one envelope and send it to grandma or send it to their mom. And so I was able to see, OK, here's a seven year old. Here's a 10 year old. Here's a 12 year old writing about mm -hmm. the same things. And, you know, and I in that in those cases, I left the odd spellings even in the letters because this is about a childhood letter. Yeah. And, you know, they would talk about coyotes and, you know, out there, you know, taking their horses out. Um, and watching, you know, I was able to tease out things about they would say their horses wouldn't eat grass there. They'd eat it here. And and, you know, having to be out in the sub-zero weather, you know, taking their their horses, you know, to water or, you know, a, you know, that pasture land was done um, is another one that I remember where it's like you, you could tell from the experiences there that they were watching the land, right? You could mm. tease this out up so you could get at their sense of place, get at what they knew about the land. Um, but these children's letters, you know, they, they, they're just charming, right? Yeah. And it's unusual to have letters from that young children. And then that, that allowed me too to think about some of the memoirs, right? Which we all know when you're reminiscing there, you know, the, the, the glow, of memory and wanting to present things and you're you've changed over your life and so you tr you remember some of the you know incidents more positively or just or traumatic things too but but we know what memory does to it, it was able, yeah. I was able to take some of those letters and then also look at how um some of these events might show up in um you know a memoir and in some cases I did have a memoir and then uh, a child's diary and then and there's differences. Yeah, differences. And then the person writing notes on their child's diary as they then wrote their memoir, right? So inter interwoven, right? Like, you know, I remember in one case, this one young girl in Alberta was talking about raising chickens and all the chickens. She recorded it in her diary. Like, as you said, it was one of these diaries that's not always reflective. But then once in a while, you get a little piece of a reflection in there. Um, but she was recording those and then written in later i'm sure um and she said well wait why didn't why isn't there a name for this one why i remember this we used to name this the this chicken you know or you know there would be little commentary about what was in the diary versus what she remembered uh so so though i really prized some of those child written documents which are hard to find um mm -hmm. you know i wish i had more but i i had some some good ones um but it's fun you could then Think about them critically is if you have the examples of memoirs or things they wrote about it about it later um can you tell us about kind of the time frame of who these kids is because these are mostly either they came to the plains when they were very young and then had their kind of formative years on the plains or they were born there kind of the first generation born um give us the sense of the time frame and like who their parents were uh where they were coming from why they were coming out to uh the region and, and so forth. Okay, so it's a it's a mix of settlers, but you have you know you have some coming from um, the Middle West, the more more traditional Middle West of Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, even um, and Vermont, even you know East too. You still have people coming from the East out West. They hear about homestead land and they, and they're coming for homesteads basically. 
Uh, and you around have, what what year is this big wave? Oh, kind of early okay. waves of settlers. Okay, so. and and this is okay. Yeah, step back here. Um, the um, it's the 1870s. I would say 1870s and 80s up through, you know, the first decade of the 20th century, because one of the things about the northern grasslands is it sort of settled in waves. And I talk about this. There's the early wave. Then there's the great kind of boom and bloom, I call it, in Canada. And in, in the Dakotas, we're used to calling it the boom. And it wasn't quite the same oomph in Canada. So it was the bloom, I called it. And <laughs> Uh, in the 80s, when more and more people came and you had more railroad building. And then there's that turn of the century where places in eastern Montana, south uh, eastern Alberta, southwestern Saskatchewan, western Dakotas, both north and south, opened up the most arid land. And people poured into that. It's kind of what I call the center of the this northern region, you know, and um Canadians kind of like to call it the the last best west of Alberta and Saskatchewan. But I argue that, hey, this is also happening in the Dakotas and eastern Montana at the same time. That was part of an advertising ploy by Canadian um, officials selling their land. Oh, um, the last best west? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's a lot. Of, I've looked at some of like the advertising that, like, say, some of the rail, rail, railroads were doing in eastern Montana or far western Kansas mm-hmm. and Nebraska, you know, like where these are really sub-marginal lands and some of the boosterism and advertising is deceptive is a kind way to put it, you know, the kind of bounteous harvest that they're promising these settlers, oh. you know? Well, I mean, and it was an abnormally um, wet set of years, you know, then, you know, the dust bowl and stuff kind of brings the region back to what it normally is. And some people were severely disappointed. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's a wave, right, on the Northern yeah. Plains, this wave of optimism coming wet years dash, right? Like there's a periodic droughts. And this is one of the things that this generation that I talk about is finally figuring out that uh, that that droughts are periodic, droughts are going to happen. We need to adjust our methods in order to stay and and you know they weren't going to give up on their project many of them um this was a hard thing for them to think about that we shouldn't be here but they also knew that they needed to do more environmental um adjustment but they came to realize that this this you know you're not we're not going to be able you know from their perspective you know they thought they could come in and change the climate some of them, even though early scientists, of course, early, as early as John Wesley Powell said, no, this is an arid land, right? Yeah. He couldn't get Congress to change legislation back then. And and a lot of people, you know, the everyday folks that I'm sort of, you know, dealing with, um, you know, they were ensnared by a lot of this um, advertising and uh, um, rain un- falls the plow, like yeah, yeah, unwarranted rain optimism. Rain. rain follows a plow, or in Canada, it was, you know, wind will bring the warm air, which will make it, you know, there was a wind theory in Canada, <laughs> and that would change the climate. So um, it was, there were equal kind of, you know, it operated on settlers, and then they had their own, as I said, sort of unwarranted optimism. But yeah, they came in waves, right? And so when I say the first generation or, or born or raised there, it's shifting in time a bit because that generation shifts. I have people, you know, born after the after 1900, like somebody like Wallace Stegner that a lot of people know about, right? Um, he's born in that time period or Wilfred Eagleston, Nora Brown from Alberta, Eagleston um, from Alberta as well, you know, th- because they came in that period, right? Later, but I have yeah. other, other people that came um, you know, in the that were born in the 1860s and early 1870s or 1880s, right? So it's a it's a rolling kind of generation. But that's what you had to do if you're taking grasslands as your base, right? And key for me was that, and key for this generation, and why I think they're sort of important is that they they experience and uh, are participants in the transformation of this from in native grasslands into agricultural lands where they're crop or pasture, right? But to go back to who they're, who's coming, 
you'd have people from the U.S. and Canada moving west to western places. You also had there's a huge kind of transnational Icelandic community um, around North Dakota, western Minnesota, the grasslands part of Minnesota, um, Manitoba, and then they send their children up to Saskatchewan and Alberta or to Western Dakotas, you know, in that next generation. Mm -hmm. So Icelanders, you know, you have a lot, a a large Scandinavian and Norwegian um, uh, immigration group. And we have Germans across this area from immigrant communities. They may have been born in Iowa or, you know, in, in, in some of these, even Scandinavian, they may, may have originated in Minnesota and their families kind of moved a little bit uh, West at a time. There's also like you, Ukrainians and uh, yeah, um, G- the Germans from Russia, like the Volga Germans, Germans like, from you know, Russia. Yeah, the yeah, Northern yeah. Plains are a shockingly um, ethnically, linguistically diverse place before the World Wars. Right, um, and then, you know other immigrant groups. Um, and and I wish I had found more, and that was the temptation to keep doing my research, to keep digging in to find representatives from different immigrant groups my own background bohemian czech they were also a big uh immigrant group coming out here yeah um, there's whole czech towns uh, exactly exactly yeah, yeah so I mean, with the with the language skills there could be a this book could have been a, a double volume right if if you were able to like dig through you know czech newspaper because there were lot, lots of these newspapers and things written in those languages and like who, who knows what they're talking about there Right, right. I mean, to to jump back, and I won't stay on this, but like doing the suffrage work that that Lori Lollum and I did, you know, one of the things I think the next kind of wave of suffrage a literature on the Northern Plains has to be delving into those ethnic immigrant newspapers to find out, like in South Dakota, we had six referenda on suffrage. And so what is being said in these immigrant communities? I mean, we got, we, we, we did a little bit of that inequality at the ballot box, just a taste to kind of show this is where we need to go with that research to, to bring debates because how immigrants voted was huge for the national suffragist, Anthony Stanton, and for the local suffragist. This was, you know, part of their push, but that's the other book. But but if you're going to talk about the Northern Plains, we have to keep digging and finding more ways of bringing in ethnic and uh, research and newspapers, either find a way to learn these languages ourselves or find the resources to get things translated, you know? Yeah. So this is a call to all grad students out there looking for an, a dissertation project. If you speak German or Czech or Ukrainian or yeah, oh gosh, yeah. or, or or Swedish, or who knows what else, like uh, Asian, Norwegian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, there's there's work to be done. Uh, a um, lot. So a lot of what you in the early chapters of your book, you're talking about uh, about the, these early childhood experiences, and uh, and maybe we'll get to the end. You also you trace them then as they leave and go on and get educations and stuff. But it's really fascinating. In in a way, you're looking at various mechanisms of location specific kind of identity formation um i wanted to kind of walk through just a a couple of them you you write about lots of sensory experiences which is not something we find we find often enough i think in sometimes in environmental histories you get more of that but um uh yeah you write a lot about uh how the how the place is uh felt and smelled and, and sounded and uh hey can you share with us some of those examples like why do you think that was uh significant and specifically i guess significant for children maybe in ways that those sensory experiences weren't identity forming for full-grown adults why is it at that, that early age that those kinds of experiences are what form uh yeah form identity and, and regional belonging yeah, yeah, nice, nice question. Um, part of it is childhood development, right? Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's first of all the whole effect of having your senses shaped by a place for the first time. That kind of body memory of experiencing heat and cold and rain and smell and growth around you 
that's part of it. The other part is psychologically, these children are, you know, they're living partly in their fantasy world and partly in a real world. They go back and forth, right? We, um, you know, you, you can see them making up stories or being influenced by stories. You know, some of them talk about, you know, trolls out in the um Laura are, these I, are these the Icelanders talking about trolls? I was going to say, yeah, Laura Goodman <laughs> Salverson, Icelander, left a memoir called Confessions of an Immigrant's Daughter, also a 1926 novel called The Viking Heart. and and But kind um, of like importing a traditional family lore, things they heard from their parents and grandparents, but then reinterpreting them and placing them out in the middle of Saskatchewan or something. Or, or yeah, or the Dakotas or the night, yeah. their fears, or or they're making up stories with with animals, right? They're their friends and they, you know, they talk about them that way and they give them intentionality and you know, um personalities and and the like a- agency, like they're assigning agency to these sentient, yeah, you know, like to these other creatures in the yeah, natural world. We, we, which means as a is a which means they learn about the land from them. They learn they interact with them, they watch them, they follow them, they play with them, you know, and then the growth around them, they'll, you know, they're amidst the flowers and the weeds and the grasses, and they they you know learn about them, you know, by s- smelling them, touching them, bringing them in, watching them bloom. Over the seasons, this is another point that, you know, sense of place is about not just your your visit out to the plains, but it's growing up with this um, land every day and being on it over the seasons, watching that growth. They're also changing it, right, by setting up yeah. settler society towns. And they're, I mean, and this, this becomes problematic for many of them later. It's almost like it, the change happened before they understood that they were actually changing it particularly if you when you get to the post world war 2 years right because then you get a different kind of more more industrial agriculture taking shape out here that that really runs you know roughshod over prairie grasses whereas they are used to and and this i argue this generation sort of has this sense of place based on a mixture of rangelands and pasture lands and agricultural lands and grasslands right they they're used to this mix and all of a sudden you start to get to the 20th you know the mid 20th century and that mix is being challenged right and they and some of them do some like i said the most thoughtful perhaps or the most attached they say we should preserve part of this mm-hmm. or their their memoirs preserve part of this um but for children i think they have this special openness in their minds and and yes they're shaped by their family culture and the culture of homesteading and white settler you know ideas but they also make up their own their they have an openness or a you know a, a way of interacting with their environment i think that puts a special kind of stamp and because it's their first you know i i say first feels first smells yeah. matters Whereas, and then they also hear their parents saying, ooh, this isn't like, you know, Eastern, you know, Canada or isn't like England. And you don't know what a beautiful flower is when they're looking at it. And and they also have a huge curiosity because their parents can't tell them what this growth is. So they make it to them also. Yeah. Yeah. They make up their own. That also encourages them kind of a folklore of the prairie. They make up their own names for plants you know, and see different, uh, you know, animals or, or other, you know, put, put, uh, uh, put names on plants that they, you know, circulates in the neighborhood, right. And and kind of thing, because, you know, and that causes some of them to go on some of the ones that I find, uh, one Nora Brown that I write a lot about who grew up in Alberta, she writes a book called Old Man's Garden, and she goes and researches all the plants. And she and she's an artist, too. So she draws them and then later paints them and becomes kind of a regional artist. And um, but she does the research about them. And she re- yet she remembers her own experience with them and her friends experience. And she'll tell the childhood names they used. She'll also bring in indigenous names, you know explores what they found and you know it's it's a it's a really unique book that she did and it's actually been republished several times i think because it's such a unique book um originally published in the 50s she and she wrote it this is amazing she wrote it in the 30s 
amidst living in the in the dust bowl and the depression, right? And she's retreating to healthy grasslands and prairie grasses and trying to record them, remember them, and in a way, figure out what's what's going on and yeah, what happened. happened. Yeah, you know. So, but obviously, she couldn't get it published in the 30s. That wasn't a time you could get a book out there. So it came out in the 50s. Yeah. Instead, but she she had been percolating, working on this for a long time, um, in her own various ways. Um, um, this had me all of this stuff about child. It had me thinking. You know, of course, immediately a lot about my own childhood. Um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and. Um, I, I, I definitely identify really like as a Pacific Northwest kid, you know, like that's, but I didn't really think critically about all the ways in which that is. And you really encapsulate that in a lot of ways. Cause I was thinking about like how we used to just go out and play in the green spaces in town or up in the mountains and like how, even when like I go back now where I'm somewhere where I see like, like sword ferns or bracken ferns and I'm like, Oh, Oh, like it if all this flood of my childhood memories and my sense of like where I'm from are tied to you know, like certain kinds of mosses on trees, like uh, I'm like, wow, like my, yeah, my sense of self and, and regional identity and belonging is really rooted in kind of like the mundane, like minutia of the natural world um, and, and stuff that I think as a kid, you have the time and freedom to just go out and play in the dirt and, yeah, be yeah. kind of uh, be aloof from the real world in ways that if you had moved there as a as an adult, even say you're an outdoorsy adult, or even some of these adults that are out there farming, mm -hmm. uh, they're they're not like just playing in the dirt, which does something different to your sense of self. I think. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and to bring up a you know, and that's all the beautiful part, and I do write about all of that. You're right, and then and then here's where I would remind you know readers you know, that this is a part of settler colonialism, right? This is the era, turn of the century of nature studies and encouraging, I mean, and they did it for a variety of reasons. In part, it's a response to industrialism and consumerism and conformity. But it's also, I argue, you know, at the same time, they're removing indigenous kids to boarding schools, trying to separate them from the nature of the plains, the grasslands, and, and participating in traditions that use traditional plants and animals for religious and just everyday ceremonies and everyday life for indigenous peoples. They're trying to sever kids from that, in particular children. On the plains, people are being encouraged to take nature studies and teach nature studies and get kids to dig in to this place, to learn it, to become centrally attached to it. See, this is part of the way I see sense of place regionalism as, as settler colonialism down the generations, right? That this, you know, it's not an explicit kind of statement, but clearly these two things are happening at the same time. Wallace Stegner did take nature study up in Saskatchewan as a part of his grade school, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at so, the same time, the indigenous kids from that place, that very place in Saskatchewan had probably just recently been removed and forcibly put in a boarding school somewhere else. Right. Or with, even with, these, with these programs of intentionally uh, yeah, cu cutting them off from that traditional world. Exactly. And in, in, in that traditional world in which land is extremely important and the growth of the land and traditional plants and animals and stories attached to that landscape that are being destroyed by the plow, destroyed by overgrazing, those si sacred sites are being transformed by these kids who, you know, you know, it's it's a complex thing. I mean, and it's um like we're all agents of settler colonialism right even the little kids are in a way participating in this especially then after the when you go then forward to the next generation and they take all those childhood experiences to uh, i mean in many ways like their parents like you know were, were the plow that broke the plains you know to yeah, um, yeah. but it was you know, this, they're, this they're... next generation that then fully developed the agriculture often completed their parents project exactly exactly and you know like arabelle thompson who as African American who wrote a pretty famous mid-century um, uh, autobiography called uh, American Daughter, and she has an experience. She goes from Iowa up to North Dakota, 
Um, and she she talks about walking barefoot behind the plow into the, you know, the, letting the soil seep up into my body, you know, and, you know, they're, they're a part of that. They're, they're helping to gather grasslands into haystacks and, and shape, you know, and so, you know, I argued those haystacks, the way the snow looked on the built land that they, you know, were creating, you know, all of that's changing a landscape. All of that's giving them that sensory input that, so when, even if they, even if as many of these people I studied did, um, another thing is many of them did leave, many stayed, but even I attended to study ones who left, but for them, they maintained a lifelong association with the place, you know, continue to write about it, continue to visit. Often in these families, you would have them, you know, they might have left, but they still got cousins or brothers or some part of the family still there. So they had this lifelong association and, and kind of renewed themselves regularly with it. But they tended to be the one that was the, you know, the one who wrote the memoir or wrote mm -hmm. about their family experience kind of thing. But um, well, yeah. let's talk about these, like, because then in the latter half of your book, you then you you kind of follow chronologically and then start thinking about those who leave. Um, what happens to some of these kids as they then go somewhere else outside of the region, especially like for education um, and then, you know, the early stages of their professional lives? Uh, how does adulthood and for many of them, I guess, adulthood uh, in the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, which kind of adds another layer of of maybe why they're thinking critically about the region? How do their their early adulthood and education experiences start to mold or change or develop their thinking about where they came from, about the plains. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I can give you, you know, a few examples. Um, first of all, travel, either for education or for work. Uh, many of them did the stints where they would work and then educate, then work some more, then educate. You know, these um, some would some were, you know, had access to 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 go to this state university systems or George Will went to Harvard, actually. Um, Nora Brown went to the Toronto School of Art. Um, in her case, you know, she went in the 20s and that's when she was formally trained in painting and started going back home in the summers to paint flowers and started, you know, it, it gave her tools with which to interpret those childhood experiences and to create a product out of them. Um, that's, I think, what spurred some of her research, you know, how artists will research things they're trying to get at to paint more accurately. I mean, uh, so she took her painting skills and did that. Somebody like George Will, um, his his work at Harvard was transformational in so many ways. He went to Harvard, I think it was around 1902. He was born in 18, mid 1880s. And he ended up taking an archaeology class in he and his buddies, and I'm sure this this whole experience deserves much more <laughs> analysis. He conducts one of the first archaeological digs under some of the Harvard archaeologists of the time um, back near Bismarck on um, Mandan Earth Lodge village sites. Prior to his experiences, even though his family had dealt in seeds and his Father had exchanged some seeds with indigenous peoples, indigenous women who grew agriculture, or um, sometimes it was a, a, cup, a kind of a fur trade couple that was still living. You know, that made that eventually made their lives in in the Bismarck area. He'd get seeds from from them. George Will had a sense as a young man, and indigenous peoples worked for his father during the height of the season, but he still had this feeling of, you know, natives are disappearing, natives are gone, right? There, He goes and he does this archaeology project, writes a big uh, report that's published in like, I think, 1906. And that's one of the documents I said. He spends his whole life charting uh, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Earth Lodge villages up and down the Missouri River where they were, down into South Dakota, all the way up doing interviews with landowners doing surveys of sites, at least where they are, not not full archaeological digs. He spends his whole life doing that while running the seed business. Um, he comes to uh, learn 
a tremendous amount. He forges relationships um, with, uh, uh, I think his name is James Holding Eagle and his wife, um, or not, I'm sorry, his mother, uh, Scattered Corn, who was uh, the daughter of one of the last Mandan corn priests and obtains uh, original corn varieties, which he and his co-author, he published a book around World War I about Native women farmers. And they were shocked to find how many uh, preserved seed varieties there were. And it's really interesting because you get the, you know, these women held back their seeds. These women didn't let, you know, different various assimilationist programs or farming techniques uh, cause them to get rid of their seeds, right? And he did this whole study. He becomes this kind of advocate and 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 there's an appropriation going on here too because he learns from these women and you kind of wish George why don't you set these women up in their own businesses and help them prosper right you know instead he's using it for his own seed business and he hybridizes back and he 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 he, he experiments with all sorts of seeds he thinks that this is going to be a way if he could just get settlers to adopt corn that was formed by indigenous women, we would have better success with agriculture. And his idea is that. But he comes over the course of his life and he participates with ceremonies and things, but he comes over the course of his life to have an understanding. And towards the end, like the 50s, he dies in 56, I think. And he's, he starts to say, you know, why did we do all this? Why couldn't they just keep their own traditions? Why did we, I mean, there's an understanding, there's a growth that I appreciate there's also appropriation. There's, you know, as I said, I just, at one point I thought to myself, George, why didn't you go into business with these women and give them their own agency here? You know, their own, let them prosper from what you're doing. Not that he ever, I don't know how much, I actually don't know how well his seed business did, but I mean, it was in business for years though, multi-generational business, but, uh, he uh he through this long process he came to know the land he watched it he wa he he watched it through the 30s right he wrote these company letters through the 30s reported on the agricultural year and he often talked about he also wrote a second book corn for the northwest and that was more of a handbook and that was where he's trying to get farmers to use this indigenous seed but farmers and he talks about, he said, you know, they're they're racist and they will not accept this because it's indigenous women's seeds. Showing you the range of thought at this time. Mm -hmm. George Will, who I'm being critical of for his appropriate, you know, his appropriations. The same time he's advocating and he he's recognizing certain forms of racism and saying, I can't get settlers. They, they look at it as inferior because these native women grew it. Right. He's he's. He he's immersed himself in this culture and he's learning and he's learning his whole life, which is also something that's interesting. The, as I said, the most thoughtful and not everybody was thoughtful, but the most thoughtful are learning things their whole life. And it, I guess it suggests to us sometimes how long that process can be to change cultural ideas, mm -hmm. ingrained ideas. And that's one of the things I hope if people from this region read they can understand that they need to get on this process become a part of this process of thinking how how there's consequences for us settler society being here that live today that we can see this trajectory in so, in some of these people but so that started with his college transformation right mm -hmm. but other people go off a lot of these students found their way out to a more economically successful life by becoming teachers rural teachers, then they would go on to some of the cities, they would become teachers. Um, some, many, many students made that trajectory uh, as their, but uh, I, or, and some went on to, I know I'm thinking of um, R.C. Russell, who be, who went to University of Saskatchewan, I think, and he became a, you know, a soil scientist and a plant scientist. And he, um, he was like George Will in that sense, working on the problems of 
agriculture and getting to know it at the same time he he's trying to figure out this space this you know what kind of agriculture can can we grow here at this point of course many people realize okay you can't have that human kind of agriculture that doesn't work here we've got to if we want to stay if we want this to be productive agriculturally we need to come up with new methods they take their love of things from childhood and work on those problems right through science through agricultural schools that are popping in land grant schools that are popping up across the plains. You have Peter Norbeck, who, who's a politician from South Dakota, first kind of Dakota born governor for South Dakota. He actually dies in the thirties. And I think that's so sad because to live your whole life and then like die before you understand that we will come out of the thirties. Um, he grew up um, on a homestead here near, um, uh, Vermilion, where I'm at, I'm at University of South Dakota, and um, it's only modestly educated. One of these people who's kind of self-educated, he, he was born in 1870. So, um, but he studied water on the plains. He had an artesian well drilling business, so he got to know farmers really well. He was a, a lover of um, birds, and so when he was in in the Senate, he worked on. Um, bird migratory legislation, you know, up and down the plains, which he dealt with. This brought him into uh, the bird migratory treaties with Canada to try to, you know, keep that bird flying. And he went on to try to help um, with wetland preserves. Some of these people towards that, you know, made careers and then tried to preserve bits and pieces that they had helped destroy <laughs> mm -hmm. through settler society in the, either the, their parents' generation or even in their early years. That was was going on, but they would, so they took their careers, many of them, you know, and worked on pro what I would call problems of the plains. The other thing that's really interesting, just reminding me here talking about Canada, US and migratory bird problems and the people that kind of trans border um, connection. One of the, I, it, I shouldn't have been surprised, but, you know, I was researching all of these people individually, you know, at, at the Saskatchewan archives board or, the Glembo in Calgary or um, South Dakota State Historical Society or uh, North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies. But I started to find um, these people talking to one another. Like they were a certain group, right? That they were involved in working on the same problem. So they're, re you know, George Will is reading uh, agricultural tracts that are coming from Canada because he realizes he's part of a northern grasslands, right? That that border doesn't divide their climate, their their grass, right? Their environment. They're reading each other. Of course, he's, he's visiting the experiment stations up in Canada. They're coming down here. Thurstina Jackson Walters, who's the Icelander, is working with Peter Norbeck on various, you know, um, things related to, you know, Scandinavians and Icelanders. And uh, they're finding publishing outlets with the same places. Uh, Agat Ron, who's a Norwegian writer, wrote a two-part memoir, um, one of them published by Minnesota, I think, Historical Society Press. The other one, North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies, which also published Thurstina Jackson Walters' Icelandic study. There are places in Canada. There, there are certain publishers known to do to be interested in these kind mm -hmm. of regional tracks, but they're reading each other. Uh, Nora Brown a is reading Joseph Kinsey Howard and other people from Montana to find out to do a research plan. If any, if people are working on problems of the plains, the border uh, fades. Right? They are, they are, they are trying to get information anywhere they can, and the people that most can help them are either on the northern grasslands in Canada or the U.S. or the prairie provinces or the plain states. And they recognize that. Uh, they recognize that they're speaking to one another. And I would find them at, I don't know if they saw each other, but they would be at the same events. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is kind of one of the last topics I wanted to eventually get to before we run out of time. But yeah, it's a transnational ecosystem that the border bisects. But you do talk, though, about how in these later years during the Great Depression and, you know, kind of towards the end of it, um, this sense of transnational, regional, just grasslands identity does start to change. And there does start to be some national flavors about how they're, you know, the plain states, the prairie provinces. Um, 
can you kind of give us a little glimpse into this transformation of how I mean, they are talking with each other. There's a lot of shared identity. But then how are they starting to divorce from one another and think of themselves un uniquely or differently? And sometimes, I mean, do you write about these Canadians complaining like, oh, all these Yanks are coming up here? And, you know, like there starts to be a little bit of antagonism there. So how does that play out then and towards the the end of your book? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's yes, there's a growing nationalism on both sides of the border. Um uh, and maybe perhaps more so in Canada, which in the 20s, nationalist, a kind of, you know, Canadian writers group, you start to get the group of seven painters, nature painters, and Nora Brown was taught by some of them. So you get to wanting to highlight Canadian culture. That's that's one factor. Um, yeah, when they all came out there, I mean, this was also a surprise, and I think would be a surprise to people in the U.S. in particular. It's not a surprise that we called the prairie provinces the northwest if you study canadian history at all but it's a surprise to find out that for many many years many of the people who came to the dakotas and montana thought they were coming to the northwest the new northwest uh and so that whole area was viewed as the northwest and at the time that has to do with how the long great plains or grasslands of north america were being divided up in the 1850s right people were coming you know to kansas nebraska that was you know the um that was the middle uh west because the grasslands were considered the west below that was oklahoma and texas and above that was the new northwest mm -hmm. so when he said middle west they were thinking not east west divisions but north south divisions and um and so there's this sense of that whole broad area being the Northwest. And one of the things I argue in kind of a one of the more difficult chapters, maybe is chapter one, lots of lots of stuff. But I argue that actually settler colonialism was interwoven between the Prairie Province and the North and the Northern Plain states. They they encouraged each other's growth. Many people who went to Canada actually came up through Minnesota and up North Dakota, up the Red River Valley. Many people who went to Alberta um, came to Fort Benton, Montana, and then up, and then you know back and forth. That They're back they, and forth lots, yeah. And building the railroad. So there's that. Over time, you, you know, going back to your question, over time, uh, they started to distinguish themselves. Um, and I would say part of that had to do with the Canadian nationalism. Part of it had to do with the Great Depression. Um, part of it, you know, and, and when I say Canadian nationalism, I mean, since the Prairie Provinces, the Prairie Provinces, of course, sat, uh, Manitoba is, it comes about in you know 1869-70, then uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta in 1905 is when they finally get made into provinces. So that kind of solidifies the Prairie Provinces, right, as a entity, and people start to write about that as the three prairie provinces so that's a step but then um uh uh what's i gonna say uh then um you know and and in some ways it's a misnomer right if you look at those huge prairie provinces there's boreal forest they're huge right there's not prairie, and i think it's a settler that, colony. That, that's off the map though <laughs> I, I think mean, well, yeah. a settler colonial map because what these mm -hmm. provinces are known for is the settler colonials who wanted to put agriculture and create those prairie provinces. So that fits in with that theme. But um, if you think about the provinces, the grasslands are the southern part of the provinces, right? They don't want to be called the northern plains, right? Because for them, the identity of their nation, the grasslands is towards the southern part of those. So that's hard for them. And they and Canada has already developing. I mean, I'm being a little bit generalistic here, but um, you know, an attitude of you know we're we're constantly being absorbed by U.S. Co commercial culture. That that's yeah. why you get the rise of artists and uh, writers groups trying to push Canadian themes right in the 20s and 30s. And um, so there's a little bit of you know that sort of a tone to it. So they don't want to be absorbed, you know, into U.S. culture. So it doesn't make sense for them to be allowed themselves to be put under the label of Northern Great Plains. But that's the United States' perspective. Yes. For and them, it's the Southern Great Plains. Exactly. And yeah, for yeah. us, at the same time, because of Plains development, we're developing 
a lexicon where we have Northern Great Plains has it has its own kind of thing. And then there's the Great Plains and then there's Southern Plains, right? Central Plains to a lesser extent. Sometimes people include Central Plains with Northern Plains. But so that that whole lexicon doesn't quite work out that way. And then key, there are key texts. I think that inch this along, there is a whole series of prairie history books centered on the plains in the 30s that put that name out there, prairies, you know, prairies and repeats it and makes it part of the national language that people use. To me, that's still the prairie provinces being incorporated into Canadian Canada's regions in its in its kind of fuller form. Same thing in the U.S. You get Walter Prescott Webb's The Great Plains, 1931. You get The Future of the Great Plains, 1936, that massive government report, right? So in the 30s, you start to get um, these nationally known texts helping, I think, to define those, those provinces. Part of the reason why I use northern grasslands. I like to use grasslands to mm-hmm. emphasize the commonality and then bring this about. Uh, so, and I think over the 20th century, of course, Canada uh, has more and more increased autonomy from Britain and they're, they're, they're nationalizing. There's periods of this. So I think that's a part of it. I've always argued that in some ways, the northern, northern plain states, you know, our relationship to the United States from a certain perspective, is very Canadian mm. in the sense that we always feel absorbed by the rest of the country. People don't know, you know, oh, you're the first person I met from South Dakota. You're the yeah. only person I know from South Dakota. Do you have electricity out there? Like, you know, that kind exactly. of Exactly. Yeah. You guys have internet, you know, that's the, you know, do you, and, and we do have some problems with, with spots, yeah. you know, that are isolated. But there's this sense, you know, I've always said, you know, in, in some ways, our relationship to the rest of the United States mirrors that of Canada's relationship mm-hmm. to the United States that we kind of understand, even on the Northern Plains, we sort of understand that feeling yeah. that our counterparts have. But I think that that's part of it. And one of the points I make in the book there towards the end is, is um, so, it, you know, so our, our, we shift from Northwest to Prairie Provinces of Canada, Northern Great Plains states of, uh, and then also Middle West creeps in there. Mid, you know the 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 clo- the more we get past the mid 20th century and, and middle west is percolating throughout the 20th century but particularly in eastern areas of the northern grasslands that can be more readily absorbed into corn hog production soybean regimes the more middle west starts to dominate thinkers of those areas. So that creeps in, you know, people Mm -hmm. have kind of understood more about the line of aridity and where that is. And, and so that sort of, that's the regional shifting uh, that is going on. Yeah. I saw that when I taught in Nebraska, I would say, you know, where are you from? And I was surprised how many said the Midwest. I was like, no, I think I should have done numbers when I taught in Lincoln versus Kearney. I wonder if you know, Carney's a little oh, farther west. Yeah. If they if they said Great Plains more, maybe than Midwest, I don't remember. I should have kept track. But um, <laughs> I have my uh, South Dakota. Yeah. I have my South Dakota students. Um, I give them a map at the beginning of class, and I what what region is South Dakota in? And like they all have yeah. them draw. Yeah, I draw the lines and to check that right, just as an exercise to get them to think about that. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, we're out of time. Do, do you want to tell us anything about what you're uh, working on next or uh, how you're keeping yourself busy? Yeah, yeah. Um, in some ways, I, I'm still working with some research that I did, you know, that that I actually carved out of this <laughs> book um, as big as it is. But I'm, I'm looking now, this was much more of a personal take, right? Charting individuals and their thoughts, you know, about the region and this development. I'm currently working on a project that looks more at formal regionalism and I'm trying to make the argument that uh while in the rest of the country that regionalist movement we associate with the 20s and 30s and early 40s is kind of waning uh it's taking off on the northern plains and a for kind of a form they're participating in that and, and in a transnational way once again 
in a transnational Canadian U.S. way, which I don't know why it continues to surprise me, but but they are still talking across the border in the, these kind of regionalist ways. So in a nutshell, that's a, a new venture that I have. But um, this has just been so delightful talking about the book with you. Um, somebody asks good questions and uh, and uh, fun. Anyway, thanks so much. Well, I really appreciate you taking your time to do this. Um, congrats on the book. Thank and, you. And um, yeah, it was really lovely. And I, I hope people will, yeah, I hope they'll read read it and then think critically kind of about their own childhood and sense of regional belonging. And yeah, I think there's a lot for us to gain from this. So thank you so much, Molly. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Brennan. All right, take care. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through. Or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critique my way. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student-researched and written micro-histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R-E-N-S-I-N-K, dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers.